um, the teaching of history is so important. I was talking to a, fo a, a focus group of students in Chicago, where I'm from, and they were in high school, Wendell Phillips um, High School, and they were talking about how upset they were that they weren't being taught their history. This was a group of predominantly African-American students. And so I asked them, why is knowing your history so important to you? And one young man said, if I don't know my history, I don't know how to value myself. He was 16 years old. If I don't know my history, I don't know how to value myself. That always stood, stuck with me. Um, that that's a student's perspective on why it's so important to know our history. So with that, I want to welcome Ursula, um, who's going to tell you something about herself. I love listening to her story. So welcome, everyone. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you, Pam, for reaching out to me. And um, I'm really thrilled to be here. I uh, am going to start off with... Um, talking a little bit about who I am and why I'm here. <laughs> and, then, um, and then I'll be talking a little bit about Mrs. Rosa Parks, um, which many of us already think we know. And so hopefully today we will be learning something we don't already know, or perhaps seeing something that we do know in, in a slightly different light. So um, before we do that, just to give you a sense of the lay of the land, um, a little bit of what today's workshop will entail. We already did the who's in the room um, before the students arrived and students, we, we know you're out there and we're so happy that you're with us. I wanna just say a special sort of um, note to the, to the students here that uh, you are getting to sort of glimpse at what educators and or educator adjacent folks um, talk about behind closed doors <laughs> when we're talking about what should students be learning, what should be happening in schools. This is one of those conversations that you get to sort of um, participate in. So we're really excited to have you here. Um, so I'm going to tell a story. We're going to start with story time. And then we're going to do an activity that's going to actually involve you doing some reading and some talking with each other. Uh, and then we'll do a lot of, um, hopefully, depending on time, we'll do a couple different kinds of discussion and debrief. Um, and then uh, we're going we're gonna to do a closing message tying it back to Mrs. Rosa Parks. So uh, my name is Ursula Wolf Roca, and uh, I'm calling in today from Portland, Oregon, uh, where I've taught high school social studies for 20 years. Uh, I'm on the editorial board of Rethinking Schools magazine, and I work as a curriculum writer and organizer for the Zen Education Project. Um, and I would say broadly that what all of that means is that I'm interested in working um, with the tools of education toward a more just society. Okay, so all of that stuff, the work I do around writing and curriculum development and in schools, it's all about using the tools of education to um, build a more just society. So Pam asked me yesterday a little bit about how I got into this work. Um, and you know, I thought of another story that I didn't tell her yesterday that I think is actually a better story. So, um, but I can include some of the other, other stuff that we talked about as well. But I think the answer to the question, how did I get into educational justice work is actually through my mother. Um, she too was a high school social studies teacher. And um, she was teaching in Baltimore Public Schools, which is where she was from. Um, she lived in a, you know, a all Jewish community. Um, she uh, was among the first teachers who um, were teaching in Baltimore Public Schools as desegregation was happening. She has fascinating stories about what that meant, um, the loss of uh, school, community for many, many black teachers who were suddenly the only at their all white, otherwise all white school. So she has tons of fascinating stories that I sort of grew up hearing and being intrigued by. But the biggest story that I thought might be interesting for us today is that she was teaching in the early 1960s. I think this was 1962. Um, and she was pulled into her principal's office in Baltimore. And her principal said to her, um, that he had some questions about some of the curriculum she had been teaching. 
And she asked him what he was talking about. And she sa he said, well, I heard that you recently showed a film. And this must have been like a film strip. <laughs> and, uh, and the film my mom had shown was a news story about SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which is a group of, as many of you on this call know, a group of youth activists who had been who had founded uh, a, a standalone sort of breakoff organization from SCLC uh, in 1960 to um, organize for desegregation and voting rights all across the South. Well, my mother's principal told her that her lesson on SNCC had been a breach of the Maryland Department of Education's. Um, uh, controversial topics clause. So at that point, the Maryland Department of Education apparently had something in its code of conduct for teachers that said that you should not be touching controversial topics um, in, in the classroom. Well, that was the first time my mom was reprimanded for what she was teaching, and it was not the last time. And my mom eventually um, lost her job um, at that school as a consequence of, of what she was teaching because she was teaching about the civil rights movement, which at the time was often conflated with communism, right? So this is still the end of the McCarthy era. Um, so anyway, <laughs> I wanted to start with that story, both because it tells you something about my origins. Um, you know, I come from a family of educators. I come from a family of educators who've long been interested in the Black Freedom Movement and in and seeing the Black Freedom Movement as sort of integral to American history and towards what we need to do um, to create a more just society. I also wanted, and I think it's probably obvious, <laughs> that I wanted to share that story just because it demonstrates that, you know, restrictions on what texts, what topics, what concepts teachers surface with their students are not new, right? And that there is a long and storied history of curriculum being a terrain of struggle on which we, where we work out, you know, sort of who we wanna be, um, where we wanna go and how we think, what we think is required in order to um, get us there. So, um, you know, the other thing I, I know I did talk to Pam about yesterday in terms of why I became a history teacher. And, and then I really am gonna be not want to share much more about myself because this is not about me uh, is because I found history incredibly liberating. I remember when I was a young person and I was looking around at my society, at my neighborhood, at my city, at my schools, at the, you know, the folks that I saw on the bus, at the houseless people I saw on the, who lived, you know, in the green spaces in my city and still do. Um, you know, as a kid, I looked around and I felt so confused because I knew things were not right, but I had no idea why. And as I started to study history, I really did find explanations. I didn't find answers because the answers is sort of like what we in each generation have to figure out, but I found explanations of at least sort of how we had gotten here. And so it's that classic, you know, adage that you can't sort of treat a disease that you can't diagnose. And to me, history is this thing that enables us to diagnose sort of the problems that we confront in the modern, in the modern moment. So to me, teaching history is not about indoctrination, which is a word we've been hearing a lot from the sponsors of a lot of the bills that have been introduced recently to restrict what teachers can do in the classroom. Um, you know, it is not about indoctrination, it's about explanation, providing young people real explanations, honest explanations, truthful explanations um, about how we got to this moment in time so that they know the score when they're trying to build a better future, right? It's really hard to do that if, if you don't sort of know what the score is. Um, and so that's, sort of my, my, you know, why history? <laughs> because I also love biology and I also love a lot of things. But to me, the why history was really that thing that it more than anything else provides me an explanation of, of how we got to be where we are. So um, I said, I wanted to start with a story and this gets to me as a teacher. And so what I'm gonna do is tell you a story 
about, um, about my classroom. Uh, and so this story is takes place the last time I had what I thought was going to be a, a normal school year. <laughs> so it's 2020, it's the fall of 2020. Um, and it's at my suburban high school that I taught at for many, many, many years, room 216, my 11th grade class, 11th graders are 16 and 17 year olds. And so first I start off the year with some community building, we write poems, we share them much to the chagrin of my students. Um, we, you know, uh, we interview each other, we do, we spend a lot of time just getting to know each other and, and making sure that we sort of know who else is in the room so that we can feel safe talking about tricky stuff. Um, and so after all that couple of weeks is done, I'm going to segue into the study of history. And so I say to my students, um, I'm going to describe someone from history. And after I'm done, I want you to tell me who it is. Okay, so I say to my students, there's this person that I'm thinking of. They are African American. They are protesting injustice. They are riding public transportation. They refuse. And, and before I can even finish the sentence, kids are going, Rosa Parks, Rosa Parks, it's Rosa Parks. Right? And here indeed is Rosa Parks. Okay, and I say, definitely, you are so right, 100% for everyone, everyone's got an A, because you knew that that was Rosa Parks I was talking about. But then I say to students, okay, I know you don't usually hear teachers say this, but get out your phones, okay, and if they don't have phones, we have Chromebooks on the desk, so kids who don't have, some kids pull out their phones, some kids pull out their Chromebooks. So they open their computers and I say to the students, okay, I'm gonna put a, I'm gonna give you a link and I want you to just spend two quiet minutes looking at this website. And so I'm gonna ask you to do the same thing my students do. And I'm gonna put this link in the chat and I want you to just start seeing what you find there. So just click on that link and then start scrolling. Whoa. <laughs> so, absolutely understand that this is right requires some technology so you could also absolutely just print out this website into a packet and kids could start um could start scrolling on that way but i'm going to do this on the screen because we've got a auditorium full of students that may not have access to the 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 website right now so what my students do is they come to this page and the first thing they see is 1841, which is like a really long time ago, okay? And they see that, oh, Frederick Douglass and his friend James N. Buffum entered a train car reserved for white passengers. And then in 1854, Elizabeth Jennings Graham um, participated in a protest. And in 1863, Charlotte Brown. And then they scroll and they scroll. And if they're sitting in Richmond, Virginia, they might scroll and notice that, ah, there's a Virginia story here. 1904? That's like 50 years before Rosa Parks, right? So, so what happens when I, this is back to my story. Um, and just so that the students in the auditorium, if you can see, there's a lot of stories here, a lot of stories. So Rosa Parks's bus protest happens in 1959, and we have all, I mean, sorry, 1955, and we have all these stories that are happening prior of folks protesting racial segregation on um, buses or trains. 
or streetcars. Okay, so in my classroom, as this is happening, as students are scrolling, is that it gets really, really quiet. And then I start to hear little gasps, like, oh my God. And I'll tell you, the little gasps are for one particular person. So I recall with crystal clarity um, that year when this white baseball playing boy who normally could not care less about history class, right, um, gets to Jackie Robinson. And he loudly exclaims, Jackie Robinson, Miss Wolf, like that Jackie Robinson? And I'm like, yep, that Jackie Robinson. And so in that moment, I said to my students, so why do you think that you all knew that Rosa Parks, right, participated in this transportation protest? And, and you know, many of you know who Jackie Robinson is, Robinson is, but you didn't know that he participated in a transportation protest. So then we start to have this conversation where we're unpacking the sort of why, like, why do we know what we know? And how did we come to know what we know, right? The convo is totally far reaching. Students are full of ideas. Um, you know, one of the things in the years prior to me have this class that I'm talking about, I did a very similar activity. And one of the things that was happening during that time was the Colin Kaepernick um, protest and debate over what he was doing and the, the rightness or wrongness of what he was doing. So a lot of students were using that to sort of frame their understanding of some of like why we might know some things versus others, particularly when it comes to um, Jackie Robinson. Um, you know, so I ask, why do you think that is? Why do you think you know some things and not others? And at first kids will definitely say things like, well, because I got taught one thing or I didn't get taught another thing. And, I'm, and then I try to push and I'm like, but, but why, right? Because you can ask students, how many of you know something like the Pledge of Allegiance, Pledge of Allegiance? And most kids at my school would raise their hand. I would say, so if we want you to know something, you know it, right? How do we get kids to know the Pledge of Allegiance? We drill it into them from the time they're teeny, right? And why did everybody know Rosa Parks? Because we drill that into her from the time that she's teeny. And so what I want students to understand is we make decisions as a society, what our students are gonna learn and by definition, what they're not gonna learn, right? And that we wanna ask ourselves, sort of what are those things that we all agree our students should know? And that's why education ends up being political, right? Because we don't all agree what young people should know. Okay, so that's my story. And that story is meant to sort of frame what we are going to do today. So I'm gonna go back to my slides. Um, and I just wanna talk quickly about this book. So this book, um, is the book on which the activity I'm about to do with you is based. Um, so what I wanna say about the story that um, I just told you is that it reveals something I think really important about Rosa Parks as a historical figure. Um, you know, she is by some metrics the most famous woman in America. So there's two winners of the most famous woman in America um, you know, that sort of go back and forth. And it's Rosa Parks. And do you all want to guess who the second one is? Or do you know who the second one is? You could just unmute if you want. <laughs> Any guesses? Michelle Obama. Oh, good guess. Oh, good guess. It is uh, Harriet Tubman. So it's really interesting to me that in the United States, the two most famous women are both black women, right? And both uh, activists. So anyway, we could talk about that all day, but we're, we're not gonna talk about that for right now. So, um, so she is by some metrics, you know, the most famous woman in America. And so based on what I just told you, there is a sort of um, double edge to that. And one of the edges is that it obscures by the, the fact that everyone knows Rosa Parks obscures this larger story that she is part of a tradition, a long tradition of activists using transportation as a site of activism and protest, right? 
So that's one side of the Rosa Parks thing. But the other thing I wanna say about Rosa Parks is that many of us think we know her, <laughs> but don't in fact know her. And so the version of Mrs. Parks that the vast majority of our curricula and popular culture um, portrays her, um, they, that curricula sort of in the words of Jean Theo Harris, the woman who wrote this book, it traps her on the bus. And that's a phrase that Dr. Theo Harris uses that I think is really useful. It acts as though she only ever did one thing of note in her life um, and that there were no precursors and no next chapter. There was that one day on the bus and that followed by the boycott and then we were marching on Washington and then the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was signed and that's it, right? Um, and so we want to both say that Rosa Parks is not an only, she's part of this long tradition. And we wanna say, you should know about Rosa Parks, but you should know the whole story of Rosa Parks. Um, and so that is what we are gonna play around with a little bit today. So um, the activity I am gonna have you do is called a mixer activity. And we have um, a lot of these mixers at the Zen Education Project website. So if you're sort of interested in in how this might be used in other avenues. Um, you can, you're, you know, all our material is on the website. It's all free and it's all, you know, downloadable. So we have these mixer activities and the basic idea of a mixer activity is that every student, and in this case, we're all students, every student is gonna get a little piece of a larger story that we want as a class to kind of quilt together. So I'm going to get one story and Pam's going to get a different story and Joel's going to get another story. And then we are going to talk with each other. And by talking with each other, we're going to be sort of quilting these different stories together into a larger tapestry. So the, there's a lot of mixers that are um, Every story is about a different person or every story is about a different um, event leading up to maybe like we have one that's for the 1848 US war with Mexico where students each get a different piece of the puzzle to understand the causes of the war. Uh, I have written one that's on voting rights and the struggle for voting rights where you meet all these different people throughout history who have struggled for voting rights. This one that we're gonna do today they're all the same person. They are all Rosa Parks. But each of us is gonna learn a different story from her life from the time that she's six years old until the end of her life, okay? And we are gonna share those stories with each other as a way of sort of um, stitching together this quilt or this tapestry to get a larger sense of who this woman was. So what I'm gonna do right now is um, go ahead and drop in the chat um, a, a list of, I just took all the people who registered for this um, workshop and I wrote your name down next to a particular role. We only have, you know, not everyone who signed up is, um, is here, which is fine and to be expected. Uh, but you should, if you pre-registered, your name should be on there. If your name isn't on there, just scroll to the bottom and you'll see that there's some open roles that just say open next to them. So when you get to this link, which I just dropped in the chat, um, you will see something that looks like this. And so you're going to find your name, right? And so Pam, for example, is down here. So she's gonna go click on this Mrs. Rosa Parks and she is gonna get a story that she's gonna read. Um, but there's 22 different stories and each story uh, tells us something different about um, Rosa Parks' life. And so uh, what I want you all to do right now, if I can get back to my share screen is being silly. So I want you to spend a couple minutes 
just reading your story, um, a couple quiet minutes, just reading your little Rosa Parks story. Don't worry about all the other ones because you can go back and read them all after the workshop, but just right now focus on the one you've been assigned. Again, if your name isn't on that document, you can just choose one of the ones that's open at the end. Um, and you want to read this role like two or three times because you're going to end up in a breakout room and you're going to share a little bit about what you learned about Rosa Parks. And so you want to sort of be familiar enough with what you read that you're going to be able to articulate it and share it with other folks. So um, I'm going to be quiet and give you um, about three minutes to just quietly read and reread the role assignment that you've been assigned. Okay, so hopefully that was enough time to marinate a little bit in your story. Uh, so I wanted to just explain um, how this happens in a classroom and hopefully there will be a version of this going on in the auditorium with the Armstrong leadership group. Um, and if not, no worries, but um, I'm just gonna grab my So in my classroom over the years, I have collected a lot, a lot of these because we do so many activities where we're standing up and walking around. So the way these mixers work in the classroom is that every student gets a clipboard, they have their pencil, they have their roll sheet, and then they get up and they have conversations with each other. So I would walk up to somebody and I would say, hi, I had Rosa Parks number three, which one did you have? And then we would share our stories and then we would go on and meet with somebody else. And we'd be taking notes on what we learned as we talked to each other. We do them so often in my classroom that kids are really trained to do them. It takes some time to get them, you know, um, used to doing them. So um, in this case, because we are on Zoom, we are going to be doing this mixer in a less lively fashion in breakout rooms. So what's gonna happen, um, the, the students are going to hopefully be talking with each other. They all have their role sheets. Um, and then we on Zoom are going to get into small groups. And um, in your small groups, these are gonna be very short conversations. You are going to, first of all, each person, you're just gonna be a group of three, and then we will come back and then I'll, break you up into another, a new group of three. So first, each person's gonna share what key moment they learned about Mrs. Parks from their role sheet. And for some of you, it's stuff you have learned before, um, but what is the information that you found out about Mrs. Parks in your role sheet? And then once all three people have shared, then you can have a follow-up discussion, which is what stands out to you? What do these stories reveal um, about the struggle for justice. Mrs. Um, Jean Theo Harris's book about Rosa Parks is called The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks. And one of the points of the book is that Rosa Parks's entire life was devoted to, in some ways, um, uh, social justice, not just this one day that we all know about. So we wanna be thinking about this this larger story. Um, so you are gonna have six minutes in the first breakout room to quickly have this conversation. What did you learn about Rosa Parks? And then what's standing out to you once you've heard the three different stories um, in that room? Welcome back, welcome back folks. So um, again, if we were doing this in person, it would be a, um, we'd just be moving around a big room with our clipboards and just whoever didn't have a partner, partnering up, having a conversation and then moving on. I usually do um, mixers for, you know, about 20, 30 minutes at the most. You kids end up usually talking to about eight or nine different individuals uh, during that time. So the goal of a mixer is not to, um, it's not that students all get the same information, but they all get a sort of broad, um, a broad um, 
cross-section of information. It's also, and this is really boring teacher talk if the kids are listening right now, it's a really good reading strategy because you're not asking them to read a lot. <laughs> so you read a little bit, but you actually end up getting a huge amount of content. Um, and so rather than sort of reading a big, you know, boring textbook chapter on the Mexican-American War, if you can do a mixer on the Mexican-American War, they sort of get hooked. And then they're more interested, they, once they already know a bunch about it, then they're more interested in reading, um, you know, longer pieces about it afterward. So we are just going to get a taste today of the mixer. I'm going to ask you to go back into breakout rooms one more time with a different set of people this time, just so you can hear a few more of the Rosa Parks stories um, so that we can have, we can participate in a debrief together after that. So Richard is going to send you back again for another six minutes, hopefully with a different configuration of folks. Once again, what story of Rosa Parks did you learn about? Um, listen to other people's stories and then have a quick conversation about what's standing out to you. Great, welcome Great. back, welcome back. So uh, what I wanna do now is turn the mic over to you all for a little bit. Um, and I have some questions here to sort of guide our debrief, but um, we wanna talk both about uh, content and we can also, if you want to talk a little bit about the pedagogy, but mostly this part of it should be content focused, meaning what did we learn about Rosa Parks? Um, maybe something we learned that we didn't know before. Did we have any sort of revelations, any aha moments? And then, you know, the sort of big question, number three, what's lost when, we, when children do not learn this fuller version of Mrs. Parks? And obviously you only got a taste. You only heard some of the 22 stories and you'll wanna go back and read them all, I'm sure, or even better read um, Dr. Theo Harris's book um, if you haven't already. But uh, I would love to just hear from you. There's no structure. You don't have to answer number one or number two or number three. You can also just offer some sort of general um, thoughts or musings that you are having at this moment. So if you want to go ahead and use the uh, raise hand feature that's on the, um, uh, what's that, what's that button called? Reactions. Thank you. The reactions button. Uh, then we can keep track of who wants to speak and in what order. And for the ALP students, um, please raise your hand and let Miss Yvette or Mr. Marvin know because we really want to hear from you guys. So let somebody know that you have a comment. Absolutely. And particularly the what did you learn about Mrs. Parks that you didn't know before? That would be super interesting for us to all hear. Okay, does anybody want to kick off our conversation? Well, I'll, I'll start. Um, I read number 15 and one of the things were the demands um, of the movement were that people be seated on a first come first served basis and that everyone be treated with, um, be treated respectfully and, and courteously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Mike, maybe you can, um, you had some interesting points, Mike. Uh, I read number seven and um, it recounted an incident where she was riding on the bus with her mother when she was a child and her mother was told to move or she'd be thrown off the bus. <laughs> and her mother said, you're not gonna touch me. And uh, fell in the back of the bus, said the same thing. <laughs> he says, if you touch her, I'm going to hang my knife in your throat. They didn't touch her. And so she she sort of had that kind of um, protest in her blood from mm -hmm. a very young age. Right. Right. And I just wonder if anyone else came had stories in which self-defense were was involved, because that's another theme throughout Rosa Parks's life, is that she was a big believer in self-defense. And one of the things that um, students often learn about is they learn about Rosa Parks as part of the nonviolent movement, which of course she was part of the nonviolent civil rights movement, but nonviolence was a, a theory of um, 
activism and a and a strategy of activism and it was often lived in folks's lives alongside a belief in self-defense um so i just want to note that and if anybody else wants to build on that uh peggy has their hand up her hand up i i had rosa parks number one and it talks about when she was six years old and she saw the black soldiers returning for from World War One, and they expected to be treated with respect, but of course they weren't. And then the <clears throat> the summer of 1919 was um, just a bunch of riots where the white people were trying to make sure that the blacks didn't regain any any um, power or political um, power. And she does talk about how her grandfather Sylvester would sit on his porch and would dare the Ku Klux Klan to come and try to attack him because he was ready to fight. And she talks about how she would go out and sit on the porch with him. So that kind of shows that, yeah, like Mike said, activism was really taught early. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And I'm so glad you brought up the the, um, Red Summer, the summer of 1919, which was, you know, characterized by this just, you know, massive um, epidemic, violent, racist violence in cities and towns all across the United States. And one of the things that's so interesting about Red Summer is that a lot of the acts of violence that are carried out involve transportation. They involve servicemen who are wearing their uniforms, having come back from war on public transportation and are targeted um, on that basis. And so one thing that's just so interesting is that if you sort of don't know the larger history of transportation um, as a site of segregation and racist violence, you also don't know how powerful transportation protests were and what they symbolize, right? I mean, there's the need to obviously be able to use transportation to, to live your life and get to work, but there's also the symbolic value of this, right? In terms of the long history um, that precedes the moment in 1955 involving uh, African-American demands for full citizenship, for full equality um, and transportation as one site where that's being worked out. Other thoughts or takeaways? I, I noticed that that we haven't really talked about number three. So I'm wondering if folks have thoughts about number three. Hi, we're ready to give oh, some great. input if you don't mind. Yes, hey. let's hear right. from the students. All right. Come on up. You can answer any questions. Shall I take the questions down so we can see these folks? Yeah. No. yeah. Come on. Okay. Go ahead. Don't be shy. Why do you think it's important in my point around history? Oh, okay. Hi, my name is Kamari. Oh. They can hear you. Oh, they can. They can hear yeah. me. Uh -huh. Oh. Hey, I'm Kamari. <laughs> What's your name? Okay. My name is Kamari. Kamari. Yeah. Good. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Can y'all ask the question again so I can answer it? Ursula, she's asking you to ask. Yeah. The question, so, so yeah. Well, well, there were a number of questions. Basically, we just want to know: Did you learn anything about Rosa Parks that you did not know before, or did anything yes, else stand out to you? So, what did you find interesting that you didn't know before? Um, that she almost got raped by one of her coworkers' friends. Right. And what did she do about that? Um, she, can I, can I say, okay, so it said that he was gonna have to kill her before he raped her. So, yeah. Yeah, she stood up to him, right? Yes, ma'am. Right. So is that different than the idea of Mrs. Rosa Parks that you had in your head? Yep. Okay, how is, it different? how is it different? How is it different? How did you imagine Mrs. Parks before reading that story? Met her like how everybody else back then protesting about rights being equal and stop segregation. And it was right. more to her story. She had more stuff other than that. And by right. in the back of the bus. Right. Right. 
And I don't know about you, one of the things I always learned about Mrs. Parks was that she was sort of tired and really quiet and kind of, I don't know, meek, like, like shy. And so when I read these stories of her where she's standing up to people who, are, who have a lot of power and could potentially really hurt her, it's a really different side of Rosa Parks than, than I certainly learned. So thank you so much for sharing. Thank I really you appreciate welcome. it. Yes, give it up to Mark. Yay. Great job. <laughs> Does anybody else out there want to share? Next. One more student. One more student. Come on, young man. Anybody else? Come on. Come on, Alana. Hi, my name is Alana. Hi, I'm Alana. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Um, what I didn't know about Rosa Parks was I didn't know she lived in Detroit for most of her life. I did think she lived in Montgomery. Right. And I knew she marched, but I didn't know what specific march she knew. I know now, but I had just forgot because the people were there. So, right. And I always knew she marched, but I didn't know she marched in the one of the most popular marches with Dr. King. Mm -hmm. Good job. Yay! Great right, and, and I just want to follow up on that one. That's such a good story. And yeah, so right. such a I love you. I love you so much. Because I'm going to go ahead and mute these folks. Oh, Got it? Yeah. And I see another hand up there, too, if somebody wants. So I just want to, yeah, we can mm -hmm. definitely call on somebody else. I just want to say that her whole life in Detroit, when she got to Detroit, was like everything a thousand times better and was everything coming up roses and did she suddenly not have to deal with the impact of white racism? No. And one of the mythologies that's really, really prominent where I live in the North is that racism is in the South. Racism is something that happens in the South. It doesn't happen in the North. And so when we teach a fuller history of Rosa Parks, we also teach kids, oh no, you know, racism is a national problem. And yes, it manifests differently. It looks different in the South than it does in the North or in the West versus the East, but it's everywhere. And when you travel Rosa Parks' biography and life story, you see, you see that it's everywhere, not just, in, not just in the South. Okay, we've got another student wanting to join us. I'm having trouble unmuting, so you all are going to have to unmute yourselves, I think. There we go. Hi. Unmute again. Hi, I'm Zariana. Hi, Dariana. And I have a question. Why did they think that Claudette Colvin wasn't as important as Rosa Parks? Mm -hmm. Even right. though she was great the first question. woman to right. sit in the front of the bus. Right. That's a great question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's a whole story about. Claudette Colvin, um, and then there's a whole like bunch of, of things that people have come to believe that are actually not entirely true. Um, and it has to do with the, the legal case that they were trying to put together. Claudette Colvin is absolutely a hero. Um, and she absolutely was before Rosa Parks, as was many, many, many other people. So I don't know if you were on the call during the first part of this presentation, but we looked at all these people who protested segregation on public transportation before Rosa Parks. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna punt on that question and say it actually is a legal was a legal question about how they wanted to put together a case regarding challenging segregation legally. And Claudette Colvin's case, they thought the people, this is the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People that was pushing these lawsuits, decided that they had a better bet with this other group of cases involving Rosa Parks rather than the Claudette Colvin case. Um, but she's absolutely someone we should know and I'm glad that you know her. 
Thank you so much for sharing that. Great um, question. That question. Thank you. Right. So a lot of people now believe this story, which turns out not to be true, that it was because Claudette Colvin was um, pregnant. And that actually is, she becomes pregnant after this, after her protest. Um, so uh, Dr. Theo Harris talks about that a lot in her book and has a great section on Claudette Colvin. And one of the other things that is in this mixer is that Rosa Parks was a mentor to Claudette Colvin. So they are often in the media like pitted against mm -hmm. each other, but, mm -hmm. but Rosa Parks invited Claudette Colvin over to her home, gave her guidance, and, and Claudette Colvin was a big admirer of Rosa Parks. So that again is the way that sometimes the media likes to try to create a, a more dramatic story that will sell but isn't necessarily accurate to, to what was going on. Um, okay, y'all, we have about eight minutes left, and I really want to quickly share something with you that we're not going to get a chance to um, spend time talking about, which was my um, plan, but, you know, the best laid plans when you have a classroom uh, never go as planned, but I am going to just um, drop it in the chat so that you can take a look at this, and I'm... Um, and I will then share my screen as well. So uh, what this is, is a checklist that I use sometimes when I work with teachers. And I know that most of, um, of the folks here are not working directly in classrooms. So, uh, sorry, this document is gonna ask you to make a copy and that's just so that you can have your own. <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's just a way to, it's called forcing a copy and it just means that everybody gets their own document so we're not all on the same document. And that was because I was gonna do an activity in which you were gonna actually do some thinking on this document. But this is one of the things I use when I work with teachers um, is I take these seven sort of characteristics of social justice um, education and I got this from um, Rethinking Our Classrooms, Teaching for Equity and Social Justice, Volume 1, which is a publication of Rethinking Schools, where I am on the editorial board. And um, Rethinking Schools editors say that, you know, classrooms that teach for equity and social justice um, fulfill these characteristics. They are grounded in students' lives. They are critical and problem-posing. They're anti-racist, pro-justice, and inclusive participatory and experiential, hopeful, joyful, kind, and visionary, activist, and culturally and linguistically inclusive and empowering. And so what I do when I work with teachers is I ask them to use this as sort of a rubric to evaluate their classroom materials, to evaluate their lessons, to evaluate their curriculum. And what I always say is it's not that every lesson is going to hit all of these, <laughs> but that at the end of the year or at the end of a unit, you're going to want to have sort of touched on all of these or, or at least um, or moved in that direction. So for today's lesson on that we did with Rosa Parks, it really maybe wasn't so grounded in students' lives. I could have perhaps done an intro that might have been more grounded in their lives, but that wasn't the big, I, I would say it, I, it really didn't do that. Um, was it critical and problem posing? Curriculum should equip students to talk back to the world. Not so much, not what we did today. Was it anti-racist, pro-justice and inclusive? Yeah. I think it talked about all kinds of different forms of racism. It talked about different actions folks take against racism or have. Was it participatory and experiential? Yeah, if you're doing this in the classroom, kids are getting up, they're talking to each other. We just heard three brilliant students share what they were thinking about and talking about with us. So absolutely it is participatory and experiential. Hopeful, joyful, kind, and visionary. I, I guess I'll leave that in the eyes of Older, I find the story of Rosa Parks um, incredibly hopeful. We definitely are learning about activism through this mixer. We're learning about what it really means to devote one's life to um, various forms of activism. And so my point here is just to sort of have 
Um, we talk a lot about standards in education. Uh, and sometimes we need to make sure that we are using the right standards by which we measure um, what young people are learning in our classrooms. And absolutely, I believe in, in you know, that we all need to learn that math and biology and, and reading and writing and all of those things, but we also wanna do so in a way um, that transmits all of this other, other important stuff as well. So that's just a resource that may be useful to you at some point, and I just wanted to share with you um, and then my final, um, my final, final slide for today is just a quote that I want to share with you. And then I'm going to ask folks to respond in the chat. Um, or if they're in the auditorium, they can um, share with a neighbor or share with the, with the group. Um, I'm just going to read you a little bit um, from Jean Theo Harris's book um, that I think is a nice way to sum up. So Dr. Theo Harris says, Rosa Parks spoke in 1995 about how she wanted to be remembered. I'd like people to say, I am a person who always wanted to be free and wanted it not only for myself. Doing justice to Parks' legacy requires acknowledging that the roots of racial and social injustice in American society are deep and manifest. It entails a profound recommitment to the goals she had spent her lifetime fighting for, real justice under the law, community empowerment and voting rights, educational access and equity, economic justice, and Black history in all parts of the curriculum. So um, I love to think about what it means to do justice to Parks' legacy, given that she is the one of the most famous women in American history, it seems only fitting that we should all think about what it means um, to do justice to Parks' legacy. So um, that concludes my presentation. We have one minute left. Um, and what I would love is if you are willing and able, I always ask folks to um, give me a little bit of feedback on um, workshops and presentations. This one was a little bit out of the ordinary because we had some people who were in person with each other and we had others who were on Zoom, but I think it was, it ended up being really lovely. I really enjoyed it. So I'm gonna drop a link, a final link into the chat, which is just a form, just has a couple of questions about how this workshop went for you. I use the feedback I get from folks um, to constantly rethink and, and reconsider how I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, and so if you wouldn't mind spending a couple minutes filling that out, I would greatly appreciate it. And I will pass it back over to Pam. Oh, Ursula, thank you so much. I just think your, your um, knowledge about teaching and curriculum and your manner, um, in which you relate to students, teachers, volunteers, all of us it has just been a wonderful experience. I know I enjoyed it. And, um, feel free to put words in the chat of thanks or appreciation to, um, to Ursula, whatever comes to your mind. And I'm wondering if anybody has um, a final question or kind of a burning thought that you wanted to ask or share students and adults alike, and our students are young adults. So um, I just wanted to say, um, Ursula, I'm sure a form of this could have been done for with, with younger students as well. Micah works with elementary school students. Um, the Armstrong Leadership Program is um, housed at Richmond Hill where Micah is housed. So it was convenient for us Great. and wonderful for us to have the high school students. But um, I'm sure we, we learned a lot too about working with uh, elementary students. Right, and I think one thing for the elementary is we really need, and so if anybody wants to take this on, we really need to get a, a elementary version of this lesson. Um, obviously, as one of the students pointed out, there's um, stories about sexual violence that are not appropriate um, for all ages in this current um, 
in this current version, which is for high schoolers. Um, so I wanted to bring something, since I knew most of the volunteers worked with elementary, since Rosa Parks does get tackled at the elementary school until we're all blue in the face, but it's, mm -hmm. not, it's not the right version of Rosa Parks. But I think um, turning something like this into a elementary friendly activity would be so fantastic. And um, yeah. Wow, that's wonderful. And we are going to stay in touch with Ursula and the Zen Education Project and um, just stay tuned through uh, the newsletter and email updates for the next um, MICA professional development offerings. And we okay. loved having you all here. Thank you so much, Ursula. And Thank have a you. great rest of the evening. Okay. Complete the evaluation form for Ursula. Let's all do that. Yeah, I dropped that in the chat. Um, I will drop it one more time. And uh, so happy to be here with you this evening, this afternoon, and um, I wish you all well. And I'm easily contactable at the Zen Education Project. Pam has my information as well. So if anyone wants to follow up with questions or comments, I'm, I'm available for that. So Great. thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Ursula. Thank okay. you everyone for coming. We loved having you here. Have a good rest of the evening.